Book 3, Conditions of Employment, Title 1, Working Conditions and Rest Periods, Chapter 1, Hours of Work, 82, Coverage. The provisions of this title shall apply to employees in all establishments and undertakings, whether for profit or not, but not to government employees, managerial employees, field personnel, members of the family of the employer who are dependent on him for support, domestic helpers, persons in the personal service of another, and workers who are paid by results as determined by the Secretary of Labor in appropriate regulations. As used herein, managerial employees refer to those whose primary duty consists of the management of the establishment in which they are employed or of a department or subdivision thereof and to other officers or members of the managerial staff. Field personnel shall refer to non-agricultural employees who regularly perform their duties away from the principal place of business or branch office of the employer and whose actual hours of work in the field cannot be determined with reasonable certainty. 83. Normal hours of work. The normal hours of work of any employee shall not exceed 8 hours a day. Health personnel in cities and municipalities with a population of at least 1 million or in hospitals and clinics with a bed capacity of at least 100 shall hold regular office hours for 8 hours a day for 5 days a week exclusive of times for meals except where the exigencies of the service require that such personnel work for 6 days or 48 hours in which case they shall be entitled to an additional compensation of at least 30% of the regular wage for work on the 6th day. For purposes of this article, health personnel shall include resident physicians, nurses, nutritionists, dietitians, pharmacists, social workers, laboratory technicians, paramedical technicians, psychologists, midwives, attendants, and all other hospital or clinical personnel. 84. Hours worked. Hours worked shall include a all time during which an employee is required to be on duty or to be at a prescribed workplace, and b all time during which an employee is suffered or permitted to work. Rest periods of short duration during work hours shall be counted as hours worked. 85. Meal periods. Subject to such regulations as the Secretary of Labor may prescribe, it shall be the duty of every employer to give his employees not less than 60 minutes time off for their regular meals. 86. Night shift differential. Every employee shall be paid a night shift differential of not less than 10% of his regular wage for each hour of work performed between 10 o'clock in the evening and 6 o'clock in the morning. 87. Overtime work. Work may be performed beyond 8 hours a day provided that the employee is paid for the overtime work, an additional compensation equivalent to his regular wage plus at least 25% thereof. Work performed beyond 8 hours on a holiday or rest day shall be paid an additional compensation equivalent to the rate of the first 8 hours on a holiday or rest day plus at least 30% thereof. 88. Under time not offset by overtime. Under time work on any particular day shall not be offset by overtime work on any other day. Permission given to the employee to go on leave on some other day of the week shall not exempt the employer from paying the additional compensation required in this chapter. 89. Emergency overtime work. Any employee may be required by the employer to perform overtime work in any of the following cases. A. When the country is at war or when any other national or local emergency has been declared by the National Assembly or the Chief Executive. B. When it is necessary to prevent loss of life or property or in case of imminent danger to public safety due to an actual or impending emergency in the locality caused by serious accidents, fire, flood, typhoon, earthquake, epidemic, or other disaster or calamity. C. When there is urgent work to be performed on machines, installations, or equipment in order to avoid serious loss or damage to the employer or some other cause of similar nature. D. When the work is necessary to prevent loss or damage to perishable goods and e where the completion or continuation of the work started before the eighth hour is necessary to prevent serious obstruction or prejudice to the business or operations of the employer any employer required to render overtime work under this article shall be paid the additional compensation required in this chapter 90 Computation of additional compensation. For purposes of computing overtime and other additional remuneration as required by this chapter, the regular wage of an employee shall include the cash wage only without deduction on account of facilities provided by the employer. Chapter 2. Weekly Rest Periods. 91. Right to Weekly Rest Day. A. 
it shall be the duty of every employer, whether operating for profit or not, to provide each of his employees a rest period of not less than 24 consecutive hours after every six consecutive normal workdays. B. The employer shall determine and schedule the weekly rest day of his employees subject to collective bargaining agreement and to such rules and regulations as the Secretary of Labor and Employment may provide. However, the employee shall respect the preference of employees as to their weekly rest day when such preference is based on religious grounds. 92. When employer may require work on a rest day. The employer may require his employees to work on any day a in case of actual or impending emergencies caused by serious accident fire flood typhoon earthquake epidemic or other disaster or calamity to prevent loss of life and property or imminent danger to public safety b in cases of urgent work to be performed at the machinery equipment or installation to avoid serious loss which the employer would otherwise suffer c in the event of abnormal pressure of work due to special circumstances where the employer cannot ordinarily be expected to resort to other measures d to prevent loss or damage to perishable goods e where the nature of the work requires continuous operations and the stoppage of work may result in irreparable injury or loss to the employer and f under other circumstances analogous or similar to the foregoing as determined by the secretary of labor and employment 93 Compensation for rest day, Sunday, or holiday work. A. Where an employee is made or permitted to work on his scheduled rest day, he shall be paid an additional compensation of at least 30% of his regular wage. An employee shall be entitled to such additional compensation for work performed on Sunday only when it is established rest day. B. When the nature of the work of the employee is such that he has no regular work days and no regular rest days can be scheduled, he shall be paid an additional compensation of at least 30% of his regular wage for work performed on Sundays and holidays. C. Work performed on any special holiday shall be paid an additional compensation of at least 30% of the regular wage of the employee. Where such holiday work falls on the employee's scheduled rest day, he shall be entitled to an additional compensation of at least 50% of his regular wage. D. When the collective bargaining agreement or other applicable employment contract stipulates the payment of a higher premium pay than that prescribed under this article, the employer shall pay such higher rate. Chapter 3. Holidays, Service Incentive, Leaves, and Service Charges 94. Right to Holiday Pay A. Every worker shall be paid his regular daily wage during regular holidays except in retail and service establishments regularly employing less than 10 workers. B. The employer may require an employee to work on any holiday but such employee shall be paid a compensation equivalent to twice his regular rate. And C. As used in this article, holiday includes New Year's Day, Monday Thursday, Good Friday, the 9th of April, the 1st of May, the 12th of June, the 4th of July, the 30th of November, the 25th and 30th of December, and the day designated by law for holding a general election. 95. Right to Service Incentive Leave A. Every employee who has rendered at least one year of service shall be entitled to a yearly service incentive leave of five days with pay. B. This provision shall not apply to those who are already enjoying the benefit herein provided, those enjoying vacation leave with pay of at least five days, and those employed in establishments regularly employing less than 10 employees or in establishments exempted from granting this benefit by the Secretary of Labor and Employment after considering the viability or financial condition of such establishment. C. The grant of benefit in excess of that provided herein shall not be made a subject of arbitration or any court or administrative action. 96. Service Charges all service charges collected by hotels, restaurants, and similar establishments shall be distributed at the rate of 85% for all covered employees and 15% for management. The share of the employees shall be equally distributed among them. In case the service charge is abolished, the share of the covered employees shall be considered integrated in their wages. Title 2 Wages, Chapter 1, Preliminary Matters, 97, Definitions, as used in this title, A, Person means an individual, partnership, association, corporation, business trust, legal representatives, or any organized group of persons. 
B. Employer includes any person acting directly or indirectly in the interest of an employer in relation to an employee and shall include the government and all its branches, subdivisions, and instrumentalities, all government-owned or controlled corporations and institutions, as well as non-profit private institutions or organizations. C. Employee includes any individual employed by an employer. D. Agriculture includes farming in all its branches and, among other things, includes cultivation and tillage of soil, dairying, the production, cultivation, growing and harvesting of any agricultural and horticultural commodities, the raising of livestock or poultry, and any practices performed by a farmer on a farm as an incident to or farming operations, but does not include the manufacturing or processing of sugar, coconuts, abaca, tobacco, pineapples, or other farm products. E. Employ includes to suffer or permit to work. D. Wage paid to any employee shall mean the remuneration of our earnings, however designated, capable of being expressed in terms of money, whether fixed or ascertained on a time, task, piece, or commission basis, or other method of calculating the same, which is payable by an employer to an employee under a written or unwritten contract of employment for work done or to be done, or for services rendered or to be rendered, and includes the fair and reasonable value, as determined by the Secretary of Labor and Employment, of board, lodging, or other facilities customarily furnished by the employer to the employee. Fair and reasonable value shall not include any profit to the employer or to any person affiliated with the employer. 98. Application of title. This title shall not apply to farm tenancy or leasehold, domestic service, and persons working in their respective homes in needlework or in any cottage industry duly registered in accordance with law. Chapter 2. Minimum Wage Rates 99. Regional Minimum Wages The minimum wage rates for agricultural and non-agricultural employees and workers in each and every region of the country shall be those prescribed by the Regional Tripartite Wages and Productivity Boards. 100. Prohibition against elimination or diminution of benefits. Nothing in this book shall be construed to eliminate or in any way diminish supplements or other employee benefits being enjoyed at the time of promulgation of this code. 101. Payment by results. A. The Secretary of Labor and Employment shall regulate the payment of wages by results, including pakyao, piecework, and other non-time work in order to ensure the payment of fair and reasonable wage rates, preferably through time and motion studies or in consultation with representatives of workers' and employers' organizations. Chapter 3. Payment of Wages 102. Forms of Payment No employer shall pay the wages of an employee by means of promissory notes, vouchers, coupons, tokens, tickets, chits, or any object other than legal tender, even when expressly requested by the employee. Payment of wages by check or money order shall be allowed when such manner of payment is customary on the date of effectivity of this code or is necessary because of special circumstances as specified in appropriate regulations to be issued by the Secretary of Labor and Employment or as stipulated in a collective bargaining agreement. 103. Time of payment. Wages shall be paid at least once every two weeks or twice a month at intervals not exceeding 16 days. If on account of force majeure or circumstances beyond the employer's control, payment of wages on or within the time herein provided cannot be made. The employer shall pay the wages immediately after such force majeure or circumstances have ceased. No employer shall make payment with less frequently than once a month. The payment of wages of employees engaged to perform a task which cannot be completed in two weeks shall be subject to the following conditions in the absence of a collective bargaining agreement or arbitration award. 1. That payments are made at intervals not exceeding 16 days in proportion to the amount of work completed. 2. That final settlement is made upon completion of the work. 104. Place of payment. Payment of wages shall be made at or near the place of undertaking except as otherwise provided by such regulations as the Secretary of Labor and Employment may prescribe under conditions to ensure greater protection of wages. 105. Direct Payment of Wages Wages shall be paid directly to the workers to whom they are due except a. In cases of force majeure, rendering such payment impossible or under other special circumstances to be determined by the Secretary of Labor and Employment 
in appropriate regulations, in which case the work may be paid through another person under written authority given by the worker for the purpose, or b, where the worker has died, in which case the employer may pay the wages of the deceased worker to the heirs of the latter without the necessity of intestate proceedings. The claimants, if they are all of age, shall execute an affidavit attesting to their relationship to the deceased and the fact that they are all of age shall execute an affidavit attesting to the relationship to the deceased and the fact that they are his heirs to the exclusion of all other persons. If any of the heirs is a minor, the affidavit shall be executed on his behalf by his natural guardian or next of kin. The affidavit shall be presented to the employer who shall make payment through the Secretary of Labor and Employment or his representative. The representative of the Secretary of Labor and Employment shall act as referee in dividing the amount paid among the heirs. The payment of wages under this article shall absolve the employer of any further liability with respect to the amount paid. 106. Contractor or Subcontractor Whenever an employer enters into a contract with another person for the performance of the former's work, the employees of the contractor and of the latter subcontractor, if any, shall be paid in accordance with the provisions of this code. In the event that the contractor or subcontractor fails to pay the wages of his employees in accordance with this code, the employer shall be jointly and severally liable with his contractor or subcontractor to such employees to the extent of the work performed under the contract in the same manner and extent that he is liable to employees directly employed by him. The Secretary of Labor and Employment may, by appropriate regulations, restrict or prohibit the contracting out of labor to protect the rights of workers established under this code. In so prohibiting or restricting, he may make appropriate distinctions between labor-only contracting and job contracting as well as differentiations within these types of contracting and determine who among the parties involved shall be considered the employer for purposes of this code to prevent any violation or circumvention of any provision of this code. There is labor-only contracting where the person supplying workers to an employer does not have substantial capital or investment in the form of tools, equipment, machineries, work premises, among others, and the workers recruited and placed by such person are performing activities which are directly related to principal business of such employer. In such cases, the person or intermediary shall be considered merely as an agent of the employer who shall be responsible to the workers in the same manner and extent as if the latter were directly employed by him. 107. Indirect Employer The provisions of the immediately preceding article shall likewise apply to any person, partnership, association, or corporation which, not being an employer, contracts with an independent contractor for the performance of any work, task, job, or project. 108. Posting of bond. An employer or indirect employer may require the contractor or subcontractor to furnish a bond equal to the cost of labor under contract on condition that the bond will answer for the wages and due the employees should the contractor or subcontractor, as the case may be, fail to pay the same. 109. Solidary Liability. The provisions of existing laws to the contrary notwithstanding, every employer or indirect employer shall be held responsible with his contractor or subcontractor for any violation of any provision of this code. For purposes of determining the extent of their civil liability under this chapter, they shall be considered as direct employers. 110. Worker preference in case of bankruptcy. In the event of bankruptcy or liquidation of an employer's business, his workers shall enjoy first preference as regards their wages and other monetary claims, any provisions of law to the contrary notwithstanding. Such unpaid wages and monetary claims shall be paid in full before claims of the government and other creditors may be paid. 111. Attorney's Fees. A. In cases of unlawful withholding of wages, the culpable party may be assessed attorney's fees equivalent to 10% of the amount of wages recovered. B. It shall be unlawful for any person to demand or accept in any judicial or administrative proceedings for the recovery of wages, attorney's fees which exceed 10% of the amount of wages recovered. Chapter 4. Prohibitions regarding wages. 112. Non-interference in disposal of wages. No employer shall limit or otherwise interfere 
with the freedom of any employee to dispose of his wages. He shall not in any manner force, compel, or oblige his employees to purchase merchandise, commodities, or other property from any other person, or otherwise make use of any store or services of such employer or any other person. 113. Wage deduction. No employer in his own behalf or in behalf of any person shall make any deduction from the wages of his employees except a. In cases where the worker is insured with his consent by the employer and the deduction is to recompense the employer for the amount paid by him as premium on the insurance. b. For union dues, in cases where the right of the worker or his union to check off has been recognized by the employer or authorized in writing by the individual worker concerned and C. In cases where the employer is authorized by law or regulations issued by the Secretary of Labor and Employment. 114. No employer shall require his worker to make deposits from which deductions shall be made for the reimbursement of loss of or damage to tools, materials, or equipment supplied by the employer, except when the employer is engaged in such trades, occupations, or business where the practice of making deductions or requiring deposits is a recognized one, or is necessary or desirable as determined by the Secretary of Labor and Employment in appropriate rules and regulations. 115. Limitations no deduction from the deposits of an employee for the actual amount of the loss or damage shall be made unless the employee has been heard thereon and his responsibility has been clearly shown. 116. Withholding of wages and kickbacks prohibited. It shall be unlawful for any person, directly or indirectly, to withhold any amount from the wages of a worker or induce him to give up any part of his wages by force, stealth, intimidation, threat, or by any other means whatsoever without the worker's consent. 117. Deduction to ensure employment. It shall be unlawful to make any deduction from the wages of any employee for the benefit of the employer or his representative or intermediary as consideration of a promise of employment or retention in employment. 118. Retaliatory measures. It shall be unlawful for an employer to refuse to pay or reduce the wages and benefits discharged or in any manner discriminate against any employee who has filed any complaint or instituted any proceeding under this title or has testified or is about to testify in such proceeds. 119. False reporting. It shall be unlawful for any person to make any statement, report, or record filed or kept pursuant to the provisions of this code, knowing such statement, report, or record to be false in any material respect. Chapter 5. Wage Studies, Wage Agreements, and Wage Determination 120. Creation of National Wages and Productivity Commission There is hereby created a National Wages and Productivity Commission, hereinafter referred to as the Commission, which shall be attached to the Department of Labor and Employment for Policy and Program Coordination. 121. Powers and Functions of the Commission The Commission shall have the following powers and functions. A. To act as a national consultative and advisory body to the President of the Philippines and Congress on matters relating to wages, incomes, and productivity. B. To formulate policies and guidelines on wages, incomes, and productivity improvement at the enterprise, industry, and national levels. C. To prescribe rules and guidelines on wages, incomes, and productivity improvement at the enterprise, industry, and national levels. D. To review regional wage levels set by the regional tripartite wages productivity boards to determine if these are in accordance with prescribed guidelines and national development plans. E. To undertake studies, researches, and surveys necessary for the attainment of its functions and objectives and to collect and compile data and periodically disseminate information on wages and productivity and other related information including but not limited to employment, cost of living, labor costs, investments, and returns. F. To review plans and programs of the regional tripartite and productivity board to determine whether these are consistent with national development plans. G. To exercise technical and administrative supervision over the regional tripartite wages and productivity boards. H. To call from time to time a 
the National Tripartite Conference of Representatives of Government, Workers, and Employers for the Consideration of Measures to Promote Wage Rationalization and Productivity, and I, to exercise such powers and functions as may be necessary to implement this Act. The Commission shall be composed of the Secretary of Labor and Employment as ex officio chairman, the Director General of the National Economic and Development Authority, NEDA, as ex officio vice chairman, and two members each from workers and employer sectors who shall be appointed by the President of the Philippines upon recommendation of the Secretary of Labor and Employment to be made on the basis of the list of nominees submitted by the workers and employer sectors respectively and who shall serve for a term of five years. The executive director of the commission shall also be a member of the commission. The commission shall be assisted by a secretariat to be headed by an executive director and two deputy directors who shall be appointed by the president of the Philippines upon the recommendation of the secretary of labor and employment. The executive director shall have the same rank, salary, benefits, and other emoluments as that of a department assistant secretary, while the deputy directors shall have the same rank, salary, benefits, and other emoluments as that of a bureau director. The members of the commission representing labor and management shall have the same rank, emoluments, allowances, and other benefits as those prescribed by law for labor and management representatives in the Employees Compensation Commission. Article 122. Creation of Regional Tripartite Wages and Productivity Boards. There is hereby created Regional Tripartite Wages and Productivity Boards, hereinafter referred to as Regional Boards in all regions, including autonomous regions as may be established by law. The Commission shall determine the offices, headquarters of the respective Regional Boards. The Regional Boards shall have the following powers and functions in the respective territorial jurisdictions. A to develop plans, programs, and projects relative to wages, incomes, and productivity improvement for the respective regions. b. To determine and fix minimum wage rates applicable in the regions, provinces, or industries therein, and to issue the corresponding wage orders, subject to guidelines issued by the Commission. c. To undertake studies, researches, and surveys necessary for the attainment of their functions, objectives, and programs, and to collect and compile data on wages, incomes, productivity, and other related information and periodically disseminate the same. d. To coordinate with the other regional boards as may be necessary to attain the policy and intention of this code. e. To receive, process, and act on applications for exemption from prescribed wage rates as may be provided by law or any wage order. and f. To exercise such other powers and functions as may be necessary to carry out their mandate under this code. Implementation of the plans, programs, and projects of the regional boards referred to in the second paragraph, letter A of this article, shall be through the respective regional offices of the Department of Labor and Employment within their territorial jurisdiction. Provided, however, that the regional boards shall have technical supervision over the regional office of the Department of Labor and Employment with respect to the implementation of said plans, programs, and projects. Each regional board shall be composed of the regional director of the Department of Labor and Employment as chairman, the regional directors of the National Economic and Development Authority, and the Department of Trade and Industry as vice chairman and two members each from workers and employer sectors who shall be appointed by the President of the Philippines. Philippines, upon the recommendation of the Secretary of Labor and Employment to be made on the basis of the list of nominees submitted by the workers and employers sectors respectively and who shall serve for a term of five years. Each regional board to be headed by its chairman shall be assisted by a secretariat. 123. Wage Order. Whenever conditions in the region so warrant, the regional board shall investigate and study all pertinent facts and based on the standards and criteria herein prescribed, shall proceed to determine whether a wage order shall be issued. Any such wage order shall take effect after 15 days from its complete publication in at least one newspaper of general circulation in the region. In the performance of its wage determining functions, the regional board shall conduct public hearings, consultations, giving notices to employees and employers groups, provincial, city, and municipal officials, and other interested parties. 
any party aggrieved by the wage order issued by the regional board may appeal such order to the commission within 10 calendar days from the publication of such order. It shall be mandatory for the commission to decide such appeal within 60 calendar days from the filing thereof. The filing of the appeal does not stay the order unless the person appealing such order shall file with the commission an undertaking with a surety or sureties satisfactory to the commission for the payment to the employees affected by the order of the corresponding increase in the event such order is affirmed. 124. Standards or criteria for minimum wage fixing. The regional minimum wages to be established by the regional board shall be as nearly adequate as is economically feasible to maintain the minimum standards of living necessary for the health, efficiency, and general well-being of the employees within the framework of the National Economic and Social Development Program. In the determination of such regional minimum wages, the regional board shall, among other relevant factors, consider the following. A. The demand for living wages. B. Wage adjustment vis-a-vis -vis the consumer price index. C. The cost of living and changes or increases therein. D. The needs of workers and their families. E. The need to induce industries to invest in the countryside. F. Improvements in standards of living. G. The prevailing wage levels. H. Fair return of the capital invested and capacity to play of employers. I. Effects on employment generation and family income, and J, the equitable distribution of income and wealth along the imperatives of economic and social development. The wages prescribed in accordance with the provisions of this title shall be the standard prevailing minimum wages in every region. These wages shall include wages varying with industries, provinces, regional board. Conditions make such local differentiation proper and necessary to effectuate the purpose of this title. Any person, company, corporation, partnership, or any other entity engaged in business shall file and register annually with the appropriate regional board, commission, and the National Statistics Office an itemized listing of their labor component, specifying the names of their workers and employees below the managerial level, including learners, apprentices, and disabled handicapped workers who were hired under the terms prescribed in the employment contracts and their corresponding salaries and wages. For the application of any prescribed wage increase by virtue of a law or wage order issued by any regional board results in distortions of the wage structure within an establishment, the employer and the union shall negotiate to correct the distortions. Any dispute arising from wage distortions shall be resolved through the grievance procedure under the collective bargaining agreement and, if it remains unresolved, through voluntary arbitration. Unless otherwise agreed by the parties in writing, such disputes shall be decided by the voluntary arbitrators within 10 calendar days from the time said dispute was referred to voluntary arbitration. In cases where there are no collective agreements or recognized labor unions, the employers and workers shall endeavor to correct such distortions. Any dispute arising therefrom shall be settled through the National Conciliation and Mediation Board and, if it remains unresolved after 10 calendar days of conciliation, shall be referred to the appropriate branch of the National Labor Relations Commission, NLRC. It shall be mandatory for the NLRC to conduct continuous hearings and decide the dispute within 20 calendar days from the time said dispute is submitted for a compulsory arbitration. The pendency of a dispute arising from a wage distortion shall not in any way delay the applicability of any increase in prescribed wage rates pursuant to the provisions of law or wage order. As used herein, a wage distortion shall mean a situation where an increase in prescribed wage rates results in the elimination or severe contraction of intentional quantitative differences in wage or salary rates between and among employee groups in an establishment as to effectively obliterate the distinctions embodied in such wage structure based on skills, length of service, or other logical basis of differentiation. All workers paid by result including those who are paid on piecework, takai, pakyao, or task basis, shall receive not less than the prescribed wage rates per 8 hours of work a day, or a proportion thereof for working less than 8 hours. All recognized learnership and apprenticeship agreements shall be considered automatically modified insofar as their wage clauses are concerned to reflect the prescribed wage rates. 125. Freedom to bargain. No wage order shall be construed to prevent workers in particular firms or enterprises or industries from bargaining for higher wages with their respective employers. 126. 
prohibition against injunction. No preliminary or permanent injunction or temporary restraining order may be issued by any court, tribunal, or other entity against any proceedings before the Commission or the Regional Boards. 127. Non-diminution of benefits. No wage order issued by any regional board shall provide for wage rates lower than the statutory minimum wage rates prescribed by Congress. Chapter 6. Administration and Enforcement. 128. Visitorial and Enforcement Power A. The Secretary of Labor and Employment or his duly authorized representatives, including labor regulation officers, shall have access to employers' records and premises at any time of the day or night whenever work is being undertaken therein and the right to copy therefrom, to question any employee and investigate any fact, condition, or matter which may be necessary to determine violations or which may aid in the enforcement of this code and of any labor law wage order or rules and regulations issued pursuant thereto. B. Notwithstanding the provisions of Articles 129 and 224 of this Code to the contrary, and in cases where the relationship of employer-employee still exists, the Secretary of Labor and Employment or his duly authorized representatives shall have the power to issue compliance orders to give effect to the labor standards provisions of this Code and other labor legislation based on the findings of labor employment and enforcement officers or industrial safety engineers made in the course of inspection. The secretary or his duly authorized representatives shall issue writs of execution to the appropriate authority for the enforcement of their orders except in cases where the employer contests the findings of the labor employment and enforcement officer and raises issues supported by documented sources of inspection. An order issued by the duly authorized representative of the Secretary of Labor and Employment under this article may be appealed to the latter. In case said order involves a monetary award, an appeal by the employer may be perfected only upon the posting of a cash or surety bond issued by a reputable bonding company duly accredited by the Secretary of Labor and Employment in the amount equivalent to the monetary award in the order appealed from. C. The Secretary of Labor and Employment may likewise order stoppage of work or suspension of operations of any unit or department of an establishment when non-compliance with the law or implementing rules and regulations poses grave and imminent danger to the health and safety of workers in the workplace. Within 24 hours, a hearing shall be conducted to determine whether an order for the stoppage of work or suspension of operations shall be lifted or not. In case the violation is attributable to the fault of the employer, he shall pay the employees concerned their salaries or wages during the period of such stoppage of work or suspension of operation. D. It shall be unlawful for any person or entity to obstruct, impede, delay, or otherwise render ineffective the orders of the Secretary of Labor and Employment or his duly authorized representatives issued pursuant to the authority granted under this article, and no inferior court or entity shall issue temporary or permanent injunction or restraining order or otherwise assume jurisdiction over any case involving the enforcement orders issued in accordance with this article. Any government employee found guilty of violation of or abuse of authority under this article shall, after appropriate administrative investigation, be subject to summary dismissal from the service. F. The Secretary of Labor and Employment may, by appropriate regulations, require employers to keep and maintain such employment records as may be necessary in aid of his visitorial and enforcement powers under this code. 129. Recovery of wages, simple money claims, and other benefits. Upon complaint of any interested party, the regional director of the Department of Labor and Employment or any of the duly authorized hearing officers of the department is empowered through summary proceeding and after due notice to hear and decide any matter involving the recovery of wages and other monetary claims and benefits, including legal interests owing to an employee or person employed in domestic or household service or house helper under this code arising from employer-employee relations, provided that such complaint does not include a claim for reinstatement, provided further that the aggregate money claims of each employer or house helper does not exceed 5,000 pesos, the regional director or hearing officer shall decide or resolve the complaint within 30 calendar days from the date of the filing of the same. Any sum thus recovered on behalf of any employer or house helper pursuant to this article shall be held in a special deposit account by and shall be paid 
on order of the Secretary of Labor and Employment or the Regional Director directly to the employee or house helper concerned. Any such sum not paid to the employee or house helper because he cannot be located after diligent and reasonable effort to locate him within a period of three years shall be held as a special fund of the Department of Labor and Employment to be used exclusively for the amelioration and benefit of workers. Any decision or resolution of the regional director or hearing officer pursuant to this provision may be appealed on the same grounds provided in Article 229 of this Code within five calendar days from receipt of a copy of said decision or resolution to the National Labor Relations Commission, which shall resolve the appeal within 10 calendar days from the submission of the last pleading required or allowed under its rules. The Secretary of Labor and Employment or his duly authorized representative may supervise the payment of unpaid wages and other monetary claims and benefits, including legal interest, found owing to any employee or house helper under this code. Title 3. Working Conditions for Special Groups of Employees Chapter 1. Employment of Women Article 130. Night Work Prohibition No woman, regardless of age, shall be employed or permitted or suffered to work with or without compensation a, in any industrial undertaking or branch thereof between 10 o'clock at night and 6 o'clock in the morning of the following day or b, in any commercial or non-industrial undertaking or branch thereof other than agricultural between midnight and 6 o'clock in the morning of the following day or c, in any agricultural undertaking at night time unless she is given a period of rest of not less than 9 consecutive hours 131. Exceptions. Superseded by Social Security Act of 1997. 132. Family Planning Services. Incentives for Family Planning. A. Establishments which are required by law to maintain a clinic or infirmary shall provide free family planning services to their employees, which shall include but not be limited to the application or use of contraceptive pills and intrauterine devices. B. In coordination with other agencies of the government engaged in the promotion of family planning, the Department of Labor and Employment shall develop and prescribe incentive bonus schemes to encourage family planning among female workers in any establishment or enterprise. 133. Discrimination Prohibited it shall be unlawful for any employer to discriminate against any woman employee with respect to terms and conditions of employment solely on account of her sex. The following are acts of discrimination. A. Payment of a lesser compensation, including wage, salary, or other form of remuneration and fringe benefits to a female employee as against a male employee for work of equal value. And B. Favoring a male employee over a female employee with respect to promotion, training, opportunities, study, and scholarship grants solely on account of their sexes. Criminal liability for the willful commission of any unlawful act as provided in this article or any violation of the rules and regulations issued pursuant to Section 2 hereof shall be penalized as provided in Articles 303 and 304 of this Code, provided that the institution of any criminal action under this provision shall not bar the aggrieved employee from filing an entirely separate and distinct action for money claims, which may include claims for damages and other affirmative reliefs. The actions hereby authorized shall proceed independently of each other. 134. Stipulation against marriage. It shall be unlawful for any employer to require as a condition of employment or continuation of employment that a woman employee shall not get married or to stipulate expressly or tacitly that upon getting married, a woman employee shall be deemed resigned or separated or to actually dismiss, discharge, discriminate, or otherwise prejudice a woman employee merely by reason of her marriage. 135. Prohibited Acts A. It shall be unlawful for any employer, 1. To deny any woman employee the benefits provided for in this chapter, or to discharge any woman employed by him for the purpose of preventing her from enjoying any of the benefits provided under this code. 2. To discharge a such woman on account of her pregnancy, or while on leave or in confinement due to her pregnancy. 3. To discharge or refuse the admission of such woman upon returning to her work for fear that she may again be pregnant. 136. 
classification of certain women workers. Any woman who is permitted or suffered to work with or without compensation in any nightclub, cocktail lounge, massage clinic, bar, or similar establishments under the effective control or supervision of the employer for a substantial period of time as determined by the Secretary of Labor and Employment shall be considered as an employee of such establishment for purposes of labor and social legislation. Chapter 2. Employment of Minors 137. Minimum Employable Age A. No child below 15 years of age shall be employed except when he works directly under the sole responsibility of his parents or guardian and his employment does not in any way interfere with his schooling. B. Any person between 15 and 18 years of age may be employed for such number of hours and such periods for the day as determined by the Secretary of Labor and Employment in appropriate regulations. C. The foregoing provisions shall in no case allow the employment of a person below 18 years of age in an undertaking which is hazardous or deleterious in nature as determined by the Secretary of Labor and Employment. 138. Prohibition against child discrimination. No employer shall discriminate against any person in respect to terms and conditions of employment on account of his age. Chapter 3. Employment of House Helpers. 139. Coverage. This chapter shall apply to all persons rendering services in households for compensation. Domestic or household service shall mean service in the employer's home, which is usually necessary or desirable for the maintenance and enjoyment thereof and includes ministering to the personal comfort and convenience of the members of the employer's household, including services of family drivers. 140. Contract of Domestic Service the original contract of domestic service shall not last for more than two years, but it may be renewed for such periods as may be agreed upon by the parties. 1 for 1. Minimum wage. A. House helpers shall be paid the following minimum wage rates. 1. 800 pesos a month for house helpers in Manila, Quezon, Pasay, and Caloocan cities and municipalities of Makati, San Juan, Mandaluyong, Mutilupa, Navotas, Malabon, Paranaque, Las Piñas, Pasig, Marikina, Valenzuela, Taguig, and Pateros in Metro Manila and in highly urbanized cities. 2. 650 pesos a month for those in other chartered cities and first-class municipalities. And 3. 550 pesos a month for those in other municipalities. Provided that the employers shall review the employment contracts of their house helpers every three years with the end in view of improving the terms and conditions thereof. Provided further, that those house helpers who are receiving at least 1,000 pesos shall be covered by the social security system and be entitled to all the benefits provided thereunder. 142. Minimum cash wage. The minimum wage rates prescribed under this chapter shall be the basic cash wages which shall be paid to the house helpers in addition to lodging, food, and medical attendance. 143. Assignment to non-household work. No house helper shall be assigned to work in a commercial, industrial, or agricultural enterprise at a wage or salary rate lower than that provided for agricultural or non-agricultural workers as prescribed herein. 144. Opportunity for education. If the house helper is under the age of 18 years, the employer shall give him or her an opportunity for at least elementary education. The cost of education shall be part of the house helper's compensation unless there is a stipulation to the contrary. 145. Treatment of house helpers. The employer shall treat the house helper in a just and humane manner. In no case shall physical violence be used upon the house helper. 146. Board, lodging, and medical attendance. The employer shall furnish the house helper free of charge, suitable and sanitary living quarters, as well as adequate food and medical attendance. 147. Indemnity for unjust termination of services. If the period of household service is fixed, Neither the employer nor the house helper may terminate the contract before the expiration of the term, except for a just cause. If the house helper is unjustly dismissed, he or she shall be paid the compensation already earned, plus that for 15 days by way of indemnity. If the house helper leaves without justifiable reason, he sh or she shall forfeit any unpaid salary to him or her, not exceeding 15 days. 1 for 8. Service of termination. Notice. If the duration of the household service is not determined either in stipulation or by the nature of the service, the employer or the house helper may give notice to put an end to the relationship five days before the intended termination of the service. 149. Employment Certification 
Upon the severance of the household service relation, the employer shall give the house helper a written statement of the nature and duration of the service and his or her efficiency and conduct as house helper. 150. Employment Record The employer may keep such records as he may deem necessary to reflect the actual terms and conditions of employment of his house helper, which the latter shall authenticate by signature or thumb mark upon request of the employer. Chapter 4. Employment of Home Workers As amended by Republic Act No. 10361 Regulation of Industrial Home Workers The employment of industrial home workers and field personnel shall be regulated by the government through the appropriate regulations issued by the Secretary of Labor and Employment to ensure the general welfare and protection of home workers and field personnel and the industries employing them. 152. Regulations of Secretary of Labor the regulations or orders to be issued pursuant to this chapter shall be designed to assure the minimum terms and conditions of employment applicable to the industrial home workers or field personnel involved. 153. Distribution of homework. <clears throat> For purposes of this chapter, the employer of home workers includes any person, natural or artificial, who, for his account or benefit or on behalf of any person residing outside the country directly or indirectly or through an employee, agent, contractor, subcontractor, or any other person, one, delivers or causes to be delivered any goods, articles, or materials to be processed or fabricated in or about a home and thereafter to be returned or to be disposed of or distributed in accordance with his directions or two, sells any goods, articles, or materials to be processed or fabricated in or about a home and then revise them after such processing or fabrication either by himself or through some other person. Chapter 5. Employment of Night Workers 154. Coverage This chapter shall apply to all persons who shall be employed or permitted or suffered to work at night except those employed in agriculture, stock raising, fishing, maritime transport, and inland navigation during a period of not less than seven consecutive hours, including the interval from midnight to five o'clock in the morning, to be determined by the Secretary of Labor and Employment after consulting the workers' representatives or labor organizations and employers. Night worker means any employed person whose work requires performance of a substantial number of hours of night work, which exceeds a specified limit. This limit shall be fixed by the Secretary of Labor after consulting the workers' representatives or labor organizations and employers. 155. Health Assessment At their request, workers shall have the right to undergo a health assessment without charge and to receive advice on how to reduce or avoid health problems associated with their work. A. Before taking up an assignment as a night worker. B. At regular intervals during such as assignment. C. If they experience health problems during such an assignment, which are not caused by factors other than the performance of night work. With the exception of a finding of unfitness for night work, the findings of such assessments shall not be transmitted to others without the worker's consent and shall not be used to their detriment. 156. Mandatory Facilities Suitable first aid facilities shall be made available for workers performing night work, including arrangements where such workers were necessary can be taken immediately to a place for appropriate treatment. The employers are likewise required to provide safe and healthful working conditions and adequate or reasonable facilities such as sleeping or resting quarters in the establishment and transportation from the work premises to the nearest point of their residence subject to exceptions and guidelines to be provided by the DOLE. 157. Transfer Night workers who are certified as unfit for night work due to health reasons shall be transferred whenever practicable to a similar job for which they are fit to work. If such transfer to a similar job is not practicable, these workers shall be granted the same benefits as other workers who are unable to work or to secure employment during such period. A night worker certified as temporarily unfit for night work shall be given the same protection against dismissal or notice of dismissal as other workers who are prevented from working for reasons of health. 158. Women Night Workers Measures shall be taken to ensure that an alternative to night work is available to women workers who would otherwise be called upon to perform such work. A. Before and after childbirth for a period of at least 16 weeks, which shall be divided between the time before and after childbirth. B. For additional periods in respect of which a medical certificate is produced st stating that said additional periods are necessary for the health of the mother or child, 
1. During pregnancy 2. During a specified time beyond the period after childbirth is fixed pursuant to subparagraph A above, the length of which shall be determined by the dole after consulting the labor organizations and employers. During the periods referred to in this article, I, a woman worker shall not be dismissed or given notice of dismissal except for just or authorized causes provided for in this code that are not connected with pregnancy, childbirth, and child care responsibilities. I, I, a woman worker shall not lose the benefits regarding her status, seniority, and access to promotion which may attach to her regular night work position. Pregnant women and nursing mothers may be allowed to work at night only if a competent physician, other than the company physician, shall certify their fitness to render night work and specify in the ease of pregnant employees the period of the pregnancy that they can safely work. The measures referred to in this article may include transfer to day work where this is possible, the provision of social security benefits or an extension of maternity leave. The provisions of this article shall not have benefits connected with maternity leave under existing laws. 159. Compensation